So I'm closing out a series today that I've been teaching on mental health. It's Mental Health Awareness Month this month in America, and it's a real issue all across America, and the Bible has plenty to say about our thought life and about mental health, and we've spoken to you several messages from different viewpoints to help you to get a grip on improving your thought life, thus improving your mental health. And today is no exception. Today I want to talk to you about the power of a renewed mind. All of us need to undergo a renewal of the mind because we're born into sin because of the sin of Adam. All of us are underneath of that when we enter the world, and our minds have to undergo a spiritual transformation in order to understand God's kingdom, his plan, his purpose, and so on and so forth. And that leads to a fruitful way of thinking. And that's what I hope that this service accomplishes today. And so let me read this verse. We'll pray, and then I'll let you be seated. So, uh, a text will be out of Romans 8, verse number 6. It says, for to set the mind on the flesh is what? Death. Is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is? Life. Okay, so you've got a choice here. It's kind of like Moses said, I set before you life and death, choose life. You have a choice. These things are set before you, but you have to make a conscious decision about what life you want to live. And if you want to live the life of peace, then you have to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. If your mind is constantly on this world and on, on the things of this earth and your mind is focused just here on the temporal, the flesh, then that's going to lead to death. Now, death in this instance is not talking just about physical death, but it's talking about a spiritual and a mental death. You won't have life flowing through you when your mind is constantly focused on the flesh. Okay? Does that make sense? So let's pray. And I, my prayer over you is going to remember the one Sunday I taught you about putting on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. My prayer for you today is that that spirit of heaviness, you would lay down that garment because you have to put on the garment of praise. You have to do it. Doesn't drop out of heaven. You have to do it. Okay? So I'm going to pray that over you, and I'm going to pray that the spirit of heaviness just leaves. And if you're here today and you're just weighed down, depressed, anxious, my prayer today is that your mind would be set free in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we come before you humbly, and we're asking you to speak to us today through the scriptures. Let our minds be open. And right now, I rebuke every thought that would lead to depression and anxiety. Command it to go. I command the spirit of heaviness to go in the name of Jesus. And I pray, God, for people to put on the garment of praise. And I pray their thoughts would be elevated today on the things of the spirit and not on the things of the flesh. So right now, according to 2 Corinthians 10, 3, Lord, we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let it be done so today. And above everything, may the name of Jesus be high and lifted up, for it's in his holy name we pray, and let everybody say amen. 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 Before you're seated, turn and greet somebody and welcome them to the house of the Lord today. Amen. So good to see you. Glad you decided to remain in town this Memorial Day weekend and be in the house of God. I'm glad to be with you today. It's good to spend some time with the family. You're my family, and I love you dearly. Love you dearly. You know, I was thinking about the praise and worship today, really, really powerful, and how it impacts our mental health. It's really, really important that we fill our minds with positive thoughts and with the word of the Lord. So 
you know, when they're, when they're singing about he'll never fail, he won't. You know, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken, right? I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why should he fail now? He won't. We'll listen to you. See what just some positive words can do for your life? See what just rehearsing something that's positive? Now, you're not, <laughs> you won't wake up tomorrow morning and go to work and hear that on the radio station. You won't get that when you go to work from your coworkers. You won't get, you have to pour into your mind the things of God, okay? The last song that we sang talked about the goodness of God. Okay? Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Man, that's impactful. That's why I said a couple of weeks ago that it's important for you to be here on time. Because you get those words moving in your mind, you begin to sing them, it can bring joy and it can bring freedom in your thought life. And it begins to renew your mind. Because the world isn't going to tell you this. The world isn't going to tell you that good things are going to run after you. Only Deuteronomy 28 is going to tell you that in this song. And so you've got to pump that in. But when we take a constant diet of TV and news and social media and everything, <laughs> the news isn't that positive. The outlook isn't that great. It's pretty bleak. But when you're serving God and you're focused on the kingdom of God, then you realize no matter what happens in this world, no matter what goes on in this world, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to make it. Amen. Somebody say, I'm going to make it. Turn to your neighbor say, you're going to make it. Yeah, in the name of Jesus, you're going to make it. And you and I have to be proactive about filling our minds with these thoughts. Now, our text has a complete opposite picture comparing two ways of thinking. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. They couldn't be more opposite. Yet those minds exist in our world. And for you to be able to move from the mindset on the flesh to the mindset on the spirit, here are several things that you're going to need to do. Here are the steps. Here's the process. If you want to move from a mind that's set on death to a mind that's set on life. You ready? Yeah. If you're ready, say ready. ready. All right, here we go. A renewed mind is not possible without repentance. Okay. I'm not. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with I don't like to be told what to do. That's all. <laughs> Having fun. But it's true. <laughs> now, I want you to understand something here about repentance. The, our cultural view of repentance, I believe, is different than the biblical view of repentance. Because the cultural view has the thought within it, you know, listen, it's, you know, re repent, hell's waiting for you, get it together, turn it around. That's not what the word repent means, okay? The word repentance is the Greek word metanoia, and it simply means having a change of mind. So Jesus and John the Baptist, when they launched their public ministries, the very first words out of their mouths in public ministry was repent. Both of them started their sermons, their public messages with the word repent. And what they're saying is, listen, you need to think differently. That's what it means. So if we were in Jesus' audience back then, that's what we would have heard. We would have heard Jesus saying, you need to think differently. 
You've been thinking this way, and that thought process isn't yielding the results you want. I'm introducing a new way. It's according to the kingdom of God. Think differently about this. And that's the challenge that I want to give to each one of you today is to think differently. I'm challenging myself. I want to align my thought life with the Word of God. I want to align my thought life with the Holy Spirit. I want my mind to be thinking God thoughts, heavenly thoughts, spirit thoughts that lead to life and peace and not fleshly thoughts that lead to death. So we always... Why do we need to constantly be vigilant about this? Because we are under a constant barrage from the world and from thoughts that are opposite kingdom thoughts. Okay? It's coming at you as soon as you turn that remote control on. It's coming at you as soon as you open up social media. The barrage is headed your way. So with that in mind... Knowing that, we, that repentance must be the beginning of a renewed mind, change the way you think, how does change come into our lives? Because we don't, as human beings, readily decide to change. We don't wake up one day and go, I think I'm going to change my life today. There are usually precursors to that. And I'm going to give you three things that cause people to change, that will make change in a person's life. Number one, the result has to be enticing enough. There has to be something that is, you believe is promised or something here that says, you know what, if I change, I'll get this result. So let me give you an example. Matthew 4, 17, Jesus preaching that first public message, repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the enticing result. Think differently because the kingdom is here. And after this verse, all through the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God over and over and over and over and over again and saying, look, the kingdom of God is this way. The kingdom of God is like this. Here's what the kingdom's about. And the kingdom has great benefits and great results. That if, if, it's in, if it, the result is enticing enough, somebody will change. Now, that doesn't happen with everyone. Other people need other motivations. So let me give you a second one. The deterrence has to be great enough. If the result isn't enticing enough, then the deterrence has to be great enough. What do I mean by the deterrence? There's a negative outcome. Rather than a positive outcome, there's a negative outcome. And that negative outcome makes me want to change my behavior. So let me give you an example in Scripture. Luke 3, 13, verse 3, Jesus said to the audience, he said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Deterrence, negative result. So if I don't want to perish, Jesus says, I've got to repent. So that will cause me to change as well if the deterrence is great enough. Now, in a practical way, we experience that in our own lives, right? As time goes on, as life progresses, if you don't take care of yourself, one day you will have a meeting with a physician, and that physician is going to take some blood work, and they're going to look at your numbers, and they're going to tell you certain things that if you don't change certain things, if you don't repent, see, take it out of the solely the spiritual context for a minute. What the doctor is saying is you better repent. If you don't change the way you think about your physical life and about the habits you have and about what you're doing, you're going to perish. You're going to die. Okay? So with some people, they, the positive outcome isn't motivating enough. They need a negative outcome to steer away from. Okay? And that's the second way that we change. The third way that we change is the pain has to be deep enough. The pain has to be deep enough. So let me give you a scripture for that. Second Corinthians, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter six. It's the Old Testament passage where Solomon building the temple, dedicating the temple, and he prays this prayer. What we get out of this, 
uh, out of Second Chronicles, past Second Chronicles 6. You remember the famous passage, Second Chronicles 7, 14, that a lot of people know, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. This is in the context of that. This comes way later. This is just one scenario that Solomon presents all these scenarios before God. God, if this happens to your people, if they pray, hear from heaven, forgive their sin. That's basically what it is. So let me give you this one scenario that he presents. This is Solomon saying, if they, God's people, sin against you, for there's no one who doesn't sin, and you are angry with them, and you give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive, I highlighted carried away captive because that's pain. If you're carried away captive by an oppressor, you're in pain. Would you all agree with that, right? Okay, and they go to a land far or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and they repent, they change their thought, and they plead with you in the land of their captivity saying, we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. And if they repent with all their heart and with all their soul. Now, this is critical. Repenting with all your heart and all your soul suggests that you're all in. Just repenting just verbally, just saying, Lord, I, just, I repent, I change my thoughts. I, and, and this is, I said this in the 9 o'clock service, but this is how I, I, over my years of experience, what I've seen in the body of Christ, here's what I've seen a lot of people do. They want relief, but they don't want deliverance. They just want a break. They want a reprieve. They want a little bit. Just give me some space. Give me a break. But they really don't want Freedom. And I've watched this over decades of ministry. This is why repentance has to be thorough and it has to be deep. It's with all their heart and all their soul. Now, if they do that in the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive, and this is repeated over and again, pray toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city you've chosen, and the house that I built for your name. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer. Okay? Now, here's the thing. What we see many times throughout Scripture with God's people is that God, in order for them to change, he has to introduce pain in order for them to do that. And when the pain is deep enough, then they will do that. This is the story of the book of Judges. Over and over again, God raises up a leader. The people fall in line. They serve God. And then after a while, the leader dies, and the people go off on their own, and they begin serving other gods. Then God has to introduce pain by sending in an oppressor. The oppressor comes in, and they fight against Israel. They take them captive, and then the people Pain is deep enough, they cry out, oh God, we need deliverance. God sends a deliverer. This pattern is repeated over and again. But we see that throughout scripture, okay? People are in a way in which they don't change unless pain is deep enough in their lives. Now, let me just say to you, please, please, do everything you can to avoid getting to that place. Change. Have a change of mind because if you don't, you don't want to experience what's coming after that. And let me just say this to you about Christianity and religion. There's a difference. Religion is about keeping rules and regulations and lists and do's and don'ts. That's behavior. Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And only out of that are you able to have a change of behavior. There's an interesting verse. I didn't share this in the 9 o'clock. Let me share it with you. It's Acts 3.19. It says, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. 
so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent and be converted. Here's what they mean. Repent means to have a change of thought. Converted means to have a change of behavior. And what religion tries to do is get you to change your behavior before you change your thought. And if you try to change behavior before you change thought, you have a frustrated life. A completely frustrated life that's trying to do the right thing, that's wanting to do the right thing, but they haven't changed their thought life first. You will not change your behavior until you change your mind. Okay? Let me tell you about the renewed mind in another uh, passage. A renewed mind is transformed by Scripture. This is the change agent. You know, I had a certain way of thinking about things before I gave my life to Christ. I had those values, those mind constructs, they were all put together based on my upbringing. Based on outside of Christ, what I viewed, family life, the world, and everything else. And I had certain ways of thinking. When I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and I began reading scripture, it began to challenge my values and the way that I thought and believed about things. At that moment, then I had the uh, uh, choice. I either decided, well, forget the word of God. I'm going to do it my way. But what I ended up doing was watching the end results of people who were doing it my way. And those results weren't all that enticing. Because when they did it their way, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And I saw that lived out in people around me. They were living their own way, living in sin, doing what they wanted to do. And it was like, I don't see anybody happy here. But the word of God began to challenge that. It began to change my construct in my mind. And 1 Corinthians 1.18 gives us an idea about how that happens. For the word of the cross the gospel, Jesus, the word of the cross is folly. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of God is the power of God to bring about the change that I need. For the word of God, the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What does all that mean? It means the word of God can go deeper than anything else can go in your life, and it can do a deep work in your life that needs to be done. And it begins to reshape the way that I think. It begins to reshape my value system. It begins to destruct and reconstruct my mind so I'm thinking properly and I'm thinking in a right way according to his word and according to life. Now I'm setting my life because I'm allowing scripture. Listen to me. Whatever you do, don't let your experience shape the scriptures. People want to live however they want to live and then take the word of God to fit that. It's not the way this works. You don't take the word of God and shape it around your experience. You take your experience and you submit it and shape it around the word of God. You let the word of God mold and shape your experience in your life. Not the other way around. Don't twist this thing up. Okay? So it's the power of God to change the way you think. And once that happens, then you're able to change the way you behave in this life. Okay? And that is the process. It's so important. A renewed mind is the key to spiritual transformation. You can't have a renewed mind without repentance, and you won't have change and transformation without a renewed mind. And the scriptures are all a part of that. Romans 12, verse 2, the very beginning of the verse says, don't be conformed to this world. I love what J.B. Phillips' translation says. I've quoted this over the years. But he translates this up here, don't be conformed to this world, by saying, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into what it wants you to be. But rather be transformed How are we transformed? 
By the renewal of your mind. How does your mind get renewed? The Word of God. The Word of God. That's why you need to be in the one-year Bible. You need to be in Scripture. You need to have Scripture in you. You need to let the Word of God shape your mind. By the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Okay. So that's how it happens. A renewed mind is key to spiritual transformation. I cannot experience transformation without my thoughts changing first. Now, here's what a renewed mind looks like. A renewed mind thinks virtuously. Philippians 4. This is what you have, again, choices. This is what you have to decide you're going to do. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, is, If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's the choice. Setting your mind on the flesh, which leads to death, or setting your mind on the spirit, which leads to life and peace. You catalog those virtues and you begin to think on those things. You begin to train your mind. Now listen, you'll have people around you. You'll have social media around you. They're going to want to suck you into a life of thought, a thought life that's thinking negatively about people, circumstances, situations. Listen, you've got to divorce yourself from those things that are kind of pulling you down and telling you that things are going to just fall apart and things are going to be terrible. and Things, things could fall apart. But if you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ and you've got your mind fixed on him, it doesn't matter the way that the world is going. Your life is secure in Jesus Christ. And that's all that matters. Doesn't matter anything else in this world. As long as they sang it earlier about your life being on a firm foundation. Christ the rock, Matthew chapter 7. Christ the rock on which I stand. When all around me is shaken. You're going to stand. You're going to stand. You're going to make it. Why? Because you're not allowing your mind to get influenced with all the stuff around you and all the negative news around you and all the politics and all the garbage and everything else that's coming out there. Your eyes are on Christ. Your mind is filled with the Word of God. Your spirit is filled with the Holy Ghost. You're anointed of the Lord, and you realize you're living according to the kingdom of God and not according to the things of this world. Come on, man of God. Come on, woman of God. You've got to stand up and say, this is how I'm going to live. I refuse to be influenced by everything else that's trying to get my mind. Think about these things. Meditate on these things. I got to let you go in four minutes, three minutes. A renewed mind is kingdom focused. Kingdom focused. That means it is governed by a different set of principles. Matthew 6, 33 tells us that rather than pursue earthly comforts and needs, we must prioritize kingdom principles. When you prioritize kingdom principles, this activates an increase in productivity in your life. Now, thinking this way is counterintuitive, and it will take effort on our part to retrain the way we think, because we have to realize that when we think according to the carnal mind, according to the flesh, we're thinking, I've got to get increase in my life. I have to produce. I have to do this. I have to do that. And Jesus said, no, what you need to do, here's the way the kingdom works. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else just happens. This all flows. This all takes care of itself. But when your priority is here, that means your affections are here. That means your desires are here. And this is never enough. 
Never enough. But if you have your thoughts fixed on me and you have your heart in me and kingdom is first, all this stuff doesn't mean a thing. That's why Paul said, because he was kingdom-minded first, he said, you know, I've had a lot and I've had nothing. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. How could he do that? Because he had kingdom first. This didn't matter. This is, this, this, whatever this is, this comes, this goes, stock market up, stock market down, economy up, economy down. This is going to change. His, this never changes. This is the rock on which I stand. 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 This is the rock on which we stand. And if you stand on that rock, you will never fall. Stand with me, please, all over the building. Hallelujah. Man, I cannot get through this sermon. I have still more to tell you. No, can't do it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I hope this is helping you today. You know, my heart for you is that you live a healthy life with a healthy mindset that is in charge and in power and that is able to overcome the darts and the things that the enemy throws your way. Because every one of us will have bo- our minds bombarded. We'll have, we'll, the, the attacks will come. But when you know how to deal with it, you're not going to succumb to that outside influence. 